Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Firefly by Philip Dowding. Uh, my name is Chantel. I am the marketing assistant at Cormorant Books and DCB, and I will be hosting today's event. Uh, this event is also in collaboration with Thunder Thighs Costumes, which you will hear more about today, and another story bookshop, which is the bookstore that we encourage you to purchase Firefly from. Another story is located in the West End of Toronto and has over 30 years of history as a proudly independent bookstore. Uh, copies of Firefly can be purchased from another story and if you add a note for a signed copy, Philippa will be able to personalize that for you. Uh, so first, before I hand things off, a bit of explanation on the structure of this evening. There will be a conversation between the author, Philippa, and Helen Kuby. The conversation will last about 30 minutes and will be followed by questions, which you can submit via the chat box. If you leave a comment or ask a question in the chat, you will automatically be entered into the giveaway uh, with a chance to win a free costume rental from Thunder Thighs Costumes. Also, guests who post a picture of themselves in costume on either Twitter or Instagram, and if you tag us or use the hashtag, which I will put in the chat, but it is hashtag Firefly Contest 2021, uh, you will then be entered into another contest to win a copy of Firefly. Uh, so now to introduce the stars of today's event. Uh, Philippa Dowding's previous children's books have been nominated for numerous literary awards in Canada, the US, and Europe, including the Circa Diamond Willow, OLA Silver Birch, OLA Red Maple, and Hackmatack Awards. Her last novel, Oculum, was a finalist for the 2019 Circa Diamond Willow Award and was nominated for the 2020 Forest of Reading Silver Birch Fiction Award and is currently being adapted into a television series. Um, Helen Kuby is a reader, writer, teacher, and teacher librarian, and the blogger behind Can Lit for Little Canadians. She has served as chair of the of Forest of Reading, a jury member for several Canadian Children's Book Awards, and a reviewer for Quill and Choir. Most importantly, she is an enthusiastic promoter of great Canadian literature for young readers. Uh, now with that, I will hand things over to Helen's capable hands and um, Please, Helen, take the night away. Thanks very much, Chantal. I'm delighted to be here. I've had the privilege of reading a number of Philippa's books and reviewing them and even have done a Q&A with her. And so it's kind of nice to do a face-to-face -face with her, even if it is virtually. So let's just get started so we can get everyone uh, on board so they can understand, uh, they can learn a little bit about Firefly the book and Firefly the character. How's that, Philippa? Sounds great. Okay. Firefly or Fifi, as her mother has called her, is a girl with a lot on her plate. She's, if she was an adult or if she was an older teen, I'd be impressed with her fortitude and her shrewdness. But she's only 13 when she starts living rough on the streets periodically to avoid an intolerable situation at her home. Philippa, tell us why you made her this age. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Helen. That's great. That's a great question. Yes, she's 13 at the beginning of the story, and she's 14 at the end of the story. Now, it's a short story. The story takes place over about 10 days, and then there's an epilogue at the very end in December, and it all takes place around Halloween. And in fact, I'm just going to read the back copy of the book so that we get we can all kind of get a quick idea of what the story's about. So here's the back cover. Uh, motorcycle cop, medieval warrior, maybe a singing lobster. If you lived in a shop with 7 million costumes, what would you choose? Firefly is taken in by her Aunt Gail at the Corseted Lady Costume Shop, which is a much better home than the park where she used to live. But there's a lot to get used to. Food, a bed, if she can bring herself to sleep in it, a cat, a new school. She even has to get used to Aunt Gail. But when you can wear anything, become anything, how do you decide who you are and which costume is the real one? So Firefly's story is that she's been taken from the street by a social worker. She's been living in a park and uh, now she's living with her at Gale. And the reason that I chose 13 turning 14 is because it's a cusp. It's, uh, it's you're not a child anymore. It's a cusp of adolescence. Um, you're just old enough to start to see that maybe the adults around you haven't made the best choices. 
And um, you're also old enough to start to differentiate yourself from your family a little bit and perhaps begin to make your own choices that are a little bit better for you, or you know, you just see the world in a slightly different way than you do if you're, as a child. This is also a middle grade book. Um, so I didn't want to make her 16. That would be a very different story. So that's why she's 13, turning 14. I don't think a lot of us fully understand the desperation that would compel a person to end up on the streets. Um, and uh, Firefly's a little bit different in that she doesn't disappear onto the street. In fact, she, she spends nights in the park across the street from the house that her mother lives in. Why, why did you choose this for her? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that's right. Firefly spends most of the summer, I, I think it's about six months, let's say, she spends in the park across from her mother's house. She uses the house. She goes in and out uh, kind of quietly to go to use the bathroom or to gra grab food, but she's really living in the park across the street. And the reason I chose a park setting is because I find Toronto parks really fascinating. Uh, it's a great setting for a book. I live in downtown Toronto, so I have spent a lot of time in parks um, and I think everyone can imagine a park. So I don't have to, as a writer, you don't have to really spend a lot of time building that world. Everybody can imagine it, even, even younger readers. Um, and it's urban green space. It's also, uh, it's a microcosm of society. So everybody is there. You see older people and you see younger people and you see moms with their kids and you see, you know, kids playing baseball. And you also see, um, particularly right now, I guess it's, it's always, but you see a lot of homelessness in our parks. And this is a way for um, Firefly to sort of hide in plain sight. It takes a while for a social worker to, to find her. And um, yes, and she's also, because this proximity to her mother's house, she's able to convince herself that she's not actually living on the street. She's living in the park. She's just across from her mom's house. So yeah, all those reasons, parks make great settings. And it's a good place well, to hide. <laughs> one thing that I found was interesting was that I, uh, that I didn't know before was that um, it's not unusual for women's shelters to limit their clients to those 16 years of age and older, which obviously Firefly would have to lie in order to use their facilities, which she did, which she did. <laughs> um, it's a very, she, she spent very little time there, but she did uh, access their, their um, facilities. Why did you actually add that in when she couldn't actually have really used it being only 13, 14 years of age, um, rather than have her uh, be picked up by Child Protective Services right away and reconnected with her aunt immediately? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Firefly drops in at this women's center and she's, much, she's underage, she's supposed to be 16 and she lies all the way through it. Um, but but uh, there's, there's a reason for it. Um, but first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about Jenny's. So the name of this women's center is Jenny's but it's short for Jenny Smilly Robertson um, Women's Center. So it's completely made up that that a particular women's shelter doesn't exist. But Jenny Smilly Robertson uh, does exist and she was Canada's first lady surgeon. And when she was practicing in 1911, she couldn't find a Toronto hospital that would accept her because she was a woman. So she and a group of intrepid doctors, uh, female doctors and uh, other healthcare workers started Women's College Hospital in 1911 on Seton Street. So um, I wanted a little tip of the hat to them because that's our family hospital and they have fantastic mental health pr program for women and all kinds of programs for women. So, so that's what, where Jenny's came from. Um, but I wanted her to have this, this uh, lifeline, I guess, because um, I wanted her to be seeking help for herself a little bit. I was talking about her cusp, she's an adolescent. So she's actually knows that she needs help. So she reaches out a little bit to these people. Uh, at the Women's uh, Center. And there's also a really important part of the story is um, that the therapists there have given her really important words. She knows what PTSD is. They've told her in this group therapy session where she's pretending to be 16, um, that you know means post-traumatic stress disorder. She knows uh, a little bit about dissociation and so what to look for. They, they've also given her some um, 
tools. So she has some breathing techniques. She has some coping mechanisms. She has some grounding techniques uh, and a little bit of self-talk. So, you know, if this is a book that a child's reading and has never heard these terms, it's actually, you know, it's a useful, it's a useful tool, I think, for readers to have actually come across these words if they've never heard them before. Um, so that's another reason why I had uh, Firefly actually have some help. <laughs> well, it's a great idea because I think that um, Firefly has acquired a lot of coping strategies that she probably didn't even know she 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 needed. Um, and uh, one of them, one of the key ones is uh, deals with the relationship with her mother. Um, uh, the, she calls her mother Joanne the mother, um, dissociating herself from from the woman. And but it's interesting because even doing that, when she when her mother reaches out to her, it really throws. Uh, poor Firefly off. Uh, and I, I want to talk about what, what does that tell us about her relationship with her mother? And where do you think this relationship could go? Um, and will she ever have a relationship with her mother? Or, and if she does, what's the configuration for it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's such a great question, Helen. Um, so Firefly really has suffered and her relationship with her mother, her mother suffers from mental health challenges and she's, um, you know, she's got addiction problems and they're also suffering from poverty because her mother has recently lost her job. Um, so, so this has affected Firefly, of course. So there are two uh, letters in the story. There's a letter at the very beginning of the story that Firefly gets through the uh, social worker. And there's a, there's a letter that comes at the very end of the story from the social worker. And the first letter sends Firefly for a loop. She's completely, she's, you know, descends into a very pretty serious uh, trauma response. But the second letter, she can handle much better 10 days later. So we know that she's in a, you know, she's stronger. She's with a family, you know, she's, she's feeling, she's in a better, better place, a better path. Um, so we know that she's much better. And so going forward, what is her relationship going to be with her mother? The, the main message that I wanted to get out there is that it's really up to her. So now she's in a place where she has choices. Um, you know, sh sure, her mother was neglectful and it doesn't mean that she will never see her mother again, but, sh but this, the, the main message that I want people to think about is that it's really up to her. She's in control however things go forward. I, I suggest, I think in the book that they'll probably will talk again one day, but that's a really important message for kids, for adults, for anyone to hear is that it's your decision. You're going forward with support, you get to decide. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, another coping strategy is her choice to, for example, she picked up um, an ACDC hoodie at <laughs> Jenny's and she's, she just wants to keep wearing it. Even when she has other opportunities, it's like, no, she, she, it, it gives her security. But it's interesting because she ends up at her Aunt Gail's, who owns the Corsetted Lady, which is a costume shop, which means that all of a sudden she's all these opportunities to wear anything she wants and become anybody she wants. In fact, you put her in, as in the cover, she's dressed as a, she's taken on the costume of a World War II flyboy. So she's got the goggles and the hat and the leather jacket. And then she even tries out a, an 1800 saloon girl. She tries out a 1500s monk outfit, um, a medieval warrior. She tries out all these wonderful outfits and, and she even wears them to school. Um, why did you choose those costumes? <laughs> uh, there were 7 million pieces in this the costume shop. Why did you choose those ones for her to, uh, among others, to, to, to try on for herself? <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Well, um, I, I'm pretty sure I said this, but this is a real costume shop in uh, Toronto's East End. So I know this con this costume shop really well. So to be completely honest, some of the choices were personal favorites. Uh, and out of 7 million, it's, you know, you have to pick something. But really, um, the idea of disguise and costume, provenance of clothes, who has clothes, who doesn't, there's a stepbrother pair in a subplot in the story where one of the stepbrothers is taking, like ripping the shirt off his little, his, his stepbrother every, every afternoon and Firefly sees this. Um, how do we feel powerful in clothes? How do we feel vulnerable in clothes? You know, who has clothes and who doesn't? Um, and so it's, it's, it's all a huge part of the story is clothing really. And 
uh, it's a journey for Firefly, right? She's She's been living on the street. She doesn't really have any clothes. Clothes are really important to her. So I chose sort of powerful and unconventional clothes for her. Um, and with one exception, there was a, so we, yes, the first story, uh, book was, or sorry, the first costume she chooses is the flyboy costume, which you can see on the cover. She's wearing, wearing a, the hat and the goggles and the jacket and World War II Firefly, or, sorry, flyboy. And um, she picks this costume because it fits her perfectly. She just sort of runs her hands across all these costumes on the shop and she finds this and she realizes it's a real flyboy costume. Some of the costumes in the shop are, are authentic, are real costumes from the period. And um, she feels an immediate connection with this man because it fits her. He couldn't have been very big. And in fact, the average age of uh, flyboys in World War II was 22. So not, you know, he wasn't a big, big, he wasn't a fully mature man or he wasn't very old. And so she wonders, did he get to grow up? Did he get to be an older man? So there's actually a few places in the story where I draw a comparison between PTSD from in war and PTSD and childhood trauma. Um, and this is one of them. And so she wears this to school and she's, she feels pretty comfortable in it because she's connected to him. Then there's another costume. The next day she wears a saloon girl costume from the 1800s, which she doesn't like because the boots are too hard to get on. <laughs> and, you know, with all those eyes, um, she would be hard to get away in a hurry, she says. So Firefly is always looking for the exits, right? She's always trying to figure out how to make a quick get getaway. Uh, the third costume she wears is a monk costume, like a great big um, sort of the, the huge hood. And she loves this. This she loves because she can hide in this. You know, she can be completely... Um, uh, safe. She feels very safe in it. And then the fourth costume is a medieval warrior costume, which I actually have. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I have a few costumes here from Thunder Thighs. And here's uh, the, the helmet and um, the big broad chest plate behind me. And she wears that. She likes this. And, and it, now it's a few days before Halloween. And um, it's starting to be fun because people are asking her, gee, where'd you get that costume? And that looks really cool and I want one. So, so now she's moving into this sort of stage. Yeah, this is kind of fun. And then the last thing she wears is a motorcycle cop um, outfit, which my son wore for Halloween when he was 13 and 14. <laughs> and he loved this costume and it's movie grade. All these costumes are incredible costumes. And so I chose that one because it's got green goggles and she really opens up at school the day, that day in those, that costume. So. Yeah, provenance, what, how do we feel powerful? How do we feel vulnerable? Who has clothes, who doesn't? Um, yeah, that's why I, uh, clothes are a big part of the story, obviously, set in a costume shop, and that's why I picked those particular clothes. Uh, Firefly does feel very vulnerable, and that's because of her PTSD. Um, one thing we do know, and I think most people think, if you have PTSD, it's because you've had, a, it's the result of a single traumatic event. That's not the case with Firefly. She's had, she's, it, it's, it's what we would have called um, cumulative developmental trauma. So chronic neglect by her mother has resulted in her PTSD. Can you tell us a little bit about her PTSD? Um, you know, you're absolutely right. Firefly definitely has PTSD. And because of her work with Jenny's, she knows it. She has a few coping tools for it. She has, um, she's dissociative through the story. She has a fairly serious blackout uh, episode in the middle of it. Um, but you know what I really want to say about about PTSD in this story is that it's not what defines her. I think that she becomes um, in a place at the end where we know that she's going to move. She's going to move through it with a lot of help and support, but she's on this pathway, this healing journey, really. Um, so that that's really what I want to say about the story. It's all the way through it, of course, but it's not a story about PTSD. It's a story no. about about how she's she's going to be okay. She's a lot more than just PTSD, right? She's hilarious. <laughs> she's hilarious yes. and she's, she's indomitable and she's really likable and she's also suffering from PTSD and she's got supports in the place at the end. So that's, that's what I'm going to say about her PTSD. Um, speaking of supports that she had, um, it's one of my favorite characters and that's her aunt Gail. This is the woman who owns the corset lady, the costume shop. And aunt Gail is fierce, she's not heavy handed, she is open, she gives Firefly protection, but she gives her freedom. She's lovely, she's lovely. And the acknowledgements tell us that you based her on your sister-in-law. 
And is that based on her personality, her actions, or both? Well, um, yeah, thanks for asking that, Helen. You know, um, this is a story, it's a family story. I've mentioned that the uh, costume shop, which we'll talk about in a minute, is a family run uh, costume shop by my extended family. And it was run uh, by my sister-in-law who was incredibly talented. And so, you know, it's a piece of fiction. So obviously it's not entirely uh, her personality but it's, it's definitely inspired by her. And so, you know, she built this costume shop from, in the, from the 1970s, the late 1970s into this enormous empire from a single rack of clothes. She's super smart, super creative. Uh, fiercely loyal to her family and her friends. Um, really, really talented. Little story, I guess she was a super knitter. She's knitting all the way through the book. And uh, I took her to a baseball game once at Rogers Center and she took her knitting <laughs> and she knit all the way through the baseball game. And she ended up with this gigantically beautiful scarf or something at the end of it. So, so that's really the portrait I wanted to make of her, you know, dedicated, smart, loyal, uh, super talented, and uh, great knitter. <laughs> and incredibly kind. She's incredibly kind. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we're not talking about the saccharine kindness. She's not super sweet. It's a very smart kindness. She, she gives Firefly, she extends that kindness to normalcy. She, she gives her the opportunity to take tons of baths, take as many baths as you want. She gives her hot chocolate with marshmallows, which is just so tender. And as I said to you, one of the things that, one of the gentlest, most intimate moments for me is when she offers to braid fireflies hair. That one thing, every time it came up, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, and these, these little moments of thoughtfulness are what help, help firefly recover. And she's just incredible that in her kindness that's that way and why do you what i want to know is why do you think those simple things they didn't have to be big things the simple you know fact that she could take as many baths as she wanted that she could have her hair braided were so important to helping helping firefly recover yeah you know that's so true um i guess I guess I find it really sweet that you find that the ten, one of the most tender moments actually having your hair braided. Um, well, I guess Firefly had had very few tender moments. There were very few normal moments. In fact, a lot of the time, all the way through the book, she's talking about normal, normal, normal. This isn't normal for me. This is normal for everybody else. And the things that you and I or most people would take for pretty granted um, that aren't normal, um, like food and clothes and school and baths, as you say, but braiding your hair is something that's just very intimate. It's something that we do for each other in families. Like, oh my gosh, I can't let you go out like that. Let me brush your hair. <laughs> let me make you presentable. Let me braid your hair. Um, grooming each other. It's very human. And I think um, I think we have to remember that this is the first night that, that uh, this hair braiding starts, the very first night that Firefly arrives in the house. And I think Aunt Gail is like casting around for something normal too. <laughs> But, you know, she's heard, she doesn't know her uh, niece very well. So I think she just in sort of almost in desperation just grabs a brush and starts brushing Firefly's hair. But, you know, these are the things that we do for each other in families and these tender little Absolutely. simple acts are things that Firefly hasn't had. So all the way through the book, these actors build and build and build. Absolutely. Well, okay, let's talk about the Crested Lady. Yeah, <laughs> the Crested Lady is the, is the costume shop of, uh, of the book Firefly, in, and I, I said to you, I, it reminds me an awful lot of um, Mr. Dressup's Tickle Trunk, because what it provides these opportunities for pretending, for play, for learning, and for friendship. It's a wonderful place, and it's based on uh, your sister-in-law's costume shop in Toronto, which is called Thunder Thighs, and I know that you had wanted this launch to include Thunder Thighs, but because of the pandemic and restrictions we can't do that so i wanted you to take us to thunder thighs <laughs> in whatever way you possibly can so that we can actually see it's a glorious place 
Yeah, thanks, Helen. It truly is a glorious place. Um, and I, as you say, we were going to have the launch there. I was really looking for, we were gonna let everybody go loose. My nephew very kindly said, yeah, let's have the party. Um, so everyone was gonna go through the stacks, wear whatever you wanted, find your inner you know, queen, whatever. And uh, I was looking forward to reading to everybody, you know, medieval warriors and lobsters and, and what have you, but uh, not to be. However, what I'm going to do is um, just talk, I'm gonna, I think, actually, I'm just gonna read a few pages. Uh, the very first day that Firefly's in the shop, she takes a walk around. And so uh, this kind of captures it pretty well. So I'm just gonna capture a few pages. This is page 30. The shop has a wide countertop beside the front door. Above the door, there's a sign and beautiful handwritten written script. The costumer is always right. Um, cute. There's an old fashioned cash register on the counter. I touch a few buttons, but nothing happens. Behind the counter, there's a long low table with a measuring tape glued to it and four different kinds of scissors on it. Long thin scissors, short curved scissors, fat bladed scissors, lots of scissors. Behind the table, there are dozens of boxes on low shelves, boxes of thread, all kinds of thread, different colors and thicknesses, boxes of buttons, big, little, cloth, leather, bright rainbows, puffy, white, black, pearly, rosettes, glass, plastic, gold, fabric, buttons, buttons, buttons. There are needles everywhere too, not syringes, which is a nice change from the park, but needle and thread needles in every possible size and thickness. There's one needle that looks like a kid's toy, it's about as long as my forearm and has a huge eye in it. There's tape with handwriting on the underside that says horsehair weaving needle. Weird, horsehair? A box of measuring tapes all carefully rolled, scraps of material and cloth bags stored under the table, balls of wool in a bin, a long thin box of knitting needles uh, beside it, dozens of knitting needles on the box, dozens. Glue sticks, a hot glue gun, a box of rhinestones that I shake gently, then open and my magpie heart thrills a little. There's another box marked fake gemstones, a box of feathers, real and fake, a shelf of weird stuffed birds and lace and hat pins and ornate gems that says fascinators. I take a look at the far wall of the workshop and there are more shelves with more boxes, boxes that run around the outside of the shop floor right up to the ceiling. There's too much to look at. Just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes filled with costume supplies to create, create any kind of costume you could ever, ever want. There's lace, more buttons, hemming materials, patches, necklaces, costume jewelry, rings, belts, rubber molds for masks or hands or feet. Then there are the rows upon rows upon rows of costumes hanging on the racks, floor to ceiling, two stories high. I have to look away and calm down. There's just so much in here. You could be anything, anybody from your wildest dreams. I open the double doors of an enormous closet. It has hundreds of hanging pocket racks, all the pockets labeled pockets mark sunglasses, reading glasses, lorgnettes, which is two tiny lenses, monocles, which is one lens, and subsections, aviator sunglasses, 1950s sunglasses, ladies reading glasses, men's, kids, colorful wire, wire, plastic antique, and on and on and on. It's mesmerizing, obsessive. You could sort forever in here. I haven't even started looking at the thousands of racks of costumes, 7 million pieces. Parts of me starts to feel a little panicky. So that's a pretty clear depiction of just this wonderful experience of being in this amazing place. It's just, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's interesting because she is, she's overwhelmed by it all. But there was one section that she had an interesting reaction to. And um, I think it's, as. Uh, I've mentioned before that it's because, you know, sometimes one person's make-believe is somebody else's reality. And uh, Firefly comes across a collection that is labeled Hobos, Urchins, Street People. And she is upset when she sees this and has to um, just avoid it completely. Why did you put that scene in? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so she does actually see one of the racks that says, there's two There's two different racks that she says. One says hobos and street urchins, and the other one says uh, just Ken, Dickensian girls and um, street people, I think, or street urchins. And it happens at the very beginning of the book. So we're not really quite sure about her story yet. In fact, we don't really know what's happening. It comes out in very slow pieces, <clears throat> excuse me as the story goes on. So her reaction to seeing something about street people, she really does shy away. It makes you think, oh, 
has what has it got to do with street people and then the second time that she sees it um she her reaction is the same really and that that time you do know so it's just it's reinforcing the fact that she was on the street but also um you know it's part of her reality leaking into the reality of of the shop basically absolutely yeah now this is this is your first piece of realistic fiction we know you well for your middle grade fantasy like oculum and um the gargoyle series the strange gift of Gwendolyn golden we know those books but this is realistic fiction and how did, how did your did your approach was there a different approach to your writing realistic fiction than writing speculative fiction um you know that's really uh interesting i had to really think about how to answer this actually um and to be completely honest the setting of the costume shop was so magical and so rich such rich material haha um that i i i really didn't feel like i was reading realistic fiction as i was uh, sorry writing realistic fiction i was definitely wandering the halls of the shop as I was writing. I was thinking about all the magical possibilities of, you know, Firefly's choices in clothes and her journey in this, her clothes. So I didn't feel like I was writing realistic fiction necessarily. I wasn't really writing about, you know, life under a bridge or in a car or something. I was writing about this incredibly beautiful, massively interesting, fascinating, magical place because frankly, they're making television shows and, you know, the magic of, of media as well. So it, it didn't really feel like realistic fiction, honestly, to write it. It certainly wasn't a struggle. And um, the story is also told in first person, and I have some experience with that. I've I have four, I guess, three of my other books: Oculum and a Strange Gift of Gwendolyn Golden, and the sequel, Everton Miles: A Stranger Than Me, are all written first person too. So I was able to sort of go back to that voice a little bit. So yeah, it it didn't really feel any different from ma writing magic realism. Well, your realistic writing is is very very strong. I can say that without a doubt. It's very compelling. Your characters are that way. And I think that Firefly could be a great jumping off for a series of books about kids in precarious situations. And, you know, whether you decide you're going to take the characters that are already, we've already been introduced to in Firefly, like there's Firefly's friend Charlie, or the, the two boys, the two stepbrothers who are, that she called Skinny Kid and not so skinny kid. Um, or, you know, there's a, a library support group um, that she she goes to the library and they're there. Uh, I think any of these characters would make for great sequels. Have you considered writing a sequel or, or have, uh, is there already one in the works? Thanks, Helen. <laughs> Thanks for your uh, um, trust in me, I guess. Uh, well, you know, funnily enough, my family have asked that and the publisher has sort of suggested it. I'm usually the last person to think about writing a sequel. Um, and you're right, there are a lot of interesting possibilities there. Uh, the story of Moss Cart, for instance, the man that she befriends in the park, or the, the social worker who is sort of a superhero herself. And you know, dressed in her own costume of bad 1980s power suits. Um, but I haven't actually thought about taking it any farther because I really wanted to leave the story in a place where we know that she's in a good place. She's moving ahead. Um, and I, and I, I really want readers, especially young readers, to think about what that journey might be and how, what choices they might make if they you know, ever found themselves in a situation like that, or, you know, talking about what Firefly should do. What, or is there a should? What choices does Firefly have ahead of her? It's a long journey. Uh, this is just the beginning of it. And I think we know that it's going to be a bright journey. Um, and certainly she's on, she's got lots of support now. So that's really where I wanted to leave it. There was a suggestion um, of somebody Somebody suggested to me, why don't you write a story from the other end of her life when she's a much older person looking back and how everything worked out for her, which I think is a really sweet idea, but um, I haven't haven't gone there yet. Well, I think that uh, anybody who picks up this book will understand that it's, she's a girl who's just trying to become her own self. That's all it is, she's trying to become her own self. Whatever costume she decides she's gonna put on, it's gonna be her. <laughs> um, and I was going to remind people in the chat that if anybody has any questions that you would like me to ask Philippa right now, um, you know, put it in. I've been checking lots of comments. There have been wonderful, wonderful comments. 
and lots of ordering going on. Um, but here, Beverly Brenna actually has a question. She says, hi, Philippa. I'm interested in your use of italics to present fireflies flashbacks. Did you plan that from the beginning or did it evolve as you worked on the manuscript? And then of course she says, congrats, which is very valid on uh, this brilliant book. I love Firefly's voice, the context of the costume shop and the inclusion of the topic of homelessness. This title rocks and I'll be sharing with my students tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much. That's lovely. Um, Yes, italic. So that actually was a bit of a, uh, I did have to sort of decide what to do. At first I had, I had her say something. There was a word, uh oh, here, I, it was something, I can't remember actually what it was, but it was her saying, here comes, or, you know, she could feel herself about to have um, a flashback. And actually the, a lot of the story is told in flashback as Helen said, but also bad dreams. So, um, but then I played with a few different things, uh, but I decided that, italics, excuse me, made the most sense. It was probably better than quotes or anything like that. So, and I think it's pretty strong. They're fairly small chunks. Nobody wants to read pages and pages of italics. So her flashbacks are all pretty short, really. So you can see on the page, especially for a younger reader, because this is a middle grade book, uh, that there's some, there's a different voice coming in. So that was, that was the best way to do it. Thanks for the question. Here's a question from the Thunder Thighs staff. What's your favorite costume in the shop? Now, I think that uh, uh, Philippa's daughter, Sarah Kim, is going to be representing Thunder Thighs and going to be answering that question. But what your favorite costume in the shop is? And have you ever rented the lobster costume for Halloween? <laughs> um, so my favorite costume in the shop is uh, a very personal one. It was, um, it was my wedding dress, actually. My sister-in-law made me this absolutely beautiful wedding dress. And as I'm saying this now, I should realize I probably should have had a picture of it, but um, it was a beautiful wedding dress. And it was, she, she often bought pieces from auction. And so she had bought this beautiful auction piece of wed wedding dress from the 1880s. And the only problem was the bride was six feet tall and had an 18 inch waist. So there was a lot of work that had to go on to it for me um, to make it fit me and beautiful hat. So, you know, it was a, just a really beautiful piece and it was rented out by CBC a few times and a few other places. So, so that's probably my favorite. Um, yeah, it is my favorite costume in the shop. And then have I ever rented the lobsters? So the lobsters are a fairly big part of the story or at, at, in one chapter anyway. And um, I just want to show you, this is the lobster head behind me. And there's a lobster, a bit of a lobster costume up there. If I move this, I, it's a bit risky. I realize so you can see there's a lobster costume behind me anyway. I couldn't convince anyone to wear it. <laughs> um, but no, I've never rented the lobsters. However, you know, we have rented, we did have some favorites. My husband was, um, loved renting the carrot costume that they used to have. And we've got some pictures of him somewhere in that ca carrot costume, which fell apart. And in the story, Charlie, uh, uh, Firefly's friend, wears the, the uh, um, carrot costume quite, a, quite a, he wears it for Halloween. And I mentioned that my son wore the uh, motorcycle cop too. So yeah, those are some of my favorites, the carrot, the wedding dress, the motorcycle cop. Don't you just want to go to Thunder Thighs? Everybody, I can see the comments. Everybody wants to go to Thunder Thighs right now. I know. Um, we've, got a couple of, we've got a couple other questions here. Here's from Karen Upper. Hi, Karen. Um, it, where did the idea from Juggers the Cat come from? <laughs> Hi, Karen. Um, so <clears throat> Juggers the Cat is short for Juggernaut. And um, Juggernaut is a stray. And the shop does occasionally, Thunder Thighs does occasionally have a cat, uh, keep, you know, whatever, keep mice down, but I don't think they have a mouse problem or anything, but, um, the, you know, just a shop cat. So kind of inspired by the shop cat that they often have. And I also wanted, um, you know, I wanted a, a, something to connect to Firefly that's a stray and he's living there and he's kind of happy. And um, it's also an opportunity for me to write a little poem, Stray Cat, Stray Cat, where your kitty catty home be at, is one of the things that Moss Cart says about cats all the time. So the kind of a little motif all the way through about this cat, this, this, this and he's on the cover too, you can see. This is, uh, by the way, I wanna mention that this cover and the back cover, which is also really beautiful. I'll just give you a little shot of that. There's Aunt Gail. There's a, a rooster and then there's a lobster and there's a, 
uh, rolling Jenny for something new. Uh, this is by Julia, Julie McLaughlin, who did just a beautiful job on the covers. So that's the story of Juggernaut. <laughs> There's another question here. This is from Marie. Marie wants to know where you got the name Firefly. So her real name is Fifi. And um, this is a name that's given to her by her mother. And as she, as I mentioned earlier, this cusp of adolescence, making choices for ourselves, moving away from being more objective about our family, she decides to rename herself. And in a scene in the book, um, she sees fireflies on, in the bushes in the park. And so she connects with them because they're very beautiful. And so this is why she chose to rename herself Firefly. Here we have another author, Colleen Nelson. Hi, Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Um, do, you have a, do you have a favorite scene in the book, one that makes you tear up when you read it? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, I do. It's, you know, it's challenging writing about your family. Um, and so I think, I think the scene that I, I, I found the most challenging to write is one that I can't really talk about because it will give too much away. Um, and I don't really want to, there's kind of a, a reveal in the story. There's a denouement um, that it makes everything really pulls everything together. And I, when you, if you're going to read the book, you're going to know that moment when you get it, <laughs> when you get there, it's actually the moment that my friends say, oh yeah, I cried at that. So uh, that's a scene that made me cry. I, I, you know, I, I try not to make myself cry when I'm writing, <laughs> but um, sometimes, especially when you're writing about a fa your family, you know, you can be quite emotional, but they, it's been really a great experience to write about the shop. I've always wanted to write about it and I've always wanted to write, you know, a tribute to my sister-in-law. Rebecca Upton asks, what was your favorite part of writing Firefly and what was the most challenging? <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, my favorite part of writing Firefly, honestly, was the funny parts. There's a lot of humor in this book, even though it's about PTSD and, you know, it's, it's, it's Firefly's had a hard, hard time with her mother. Um, I, I think my actually my favorite chapter is a chapter called There's Always a Guy in a Gorilla Suit. And it's the morning after they rented a bunch of Halloween uh, costumes out on Saturday. So it's Sunday morning and all the costumes are coming back. And the first guy at the door, when they open the door is a guy in a gorilla suit. Um, so <laughs> I actually had a lot of fun writing that scene because Firefly is like, oh my gosh, there's a guy in a gorilla suit. And Aunt Gail says, yeah, there's always a guy in a gorilla suit. <laughs> and so, so the humor, I think, Rebecca, was what I most enjoyed. And I'm sorry, the second part of that question was what was the most challenging? Is that right? Yeah. What was the most challenging? Um, I guess the most challenging was was um, balancing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, the pain of the story and also the humor of the story, like finding that nice balance where you you can feel really moved by Firefly's flashbacks and her bad dreams, but also balance that with the, with the right kind of uh, joy and humor and and humor from Aunt Gail. Aunt Gail's pretty funny too. <laughs> Yeah. And sweet, 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 sweet. Mahtab Darsten, hi Mahtab, all the way from out there. If your family, her question is, if your family has read Firefly, what was the reaction to it? Hi Mahtab, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, my family has read Firefly. Um, in fact, when you're writing about your family, I, ad I advise all my writer friends to make sure that they're okay with it all the way through. <laughs> you know, I have this idea to write this book, are you okay with it? I've written this book. Are you okay with it? My publisher is going to publish this book. Are you okay with it? You know, you got to keep them on side. Um, they, they are all really supportive. I'm very lucky. Um, you know, that my, my family, my, my nephew at uh, Firefly at Thunder Thighs is, uh, was really big supporter, really behind the book. Um, my, my immediate family, my daughter, my son, my husband, they all worked there. My, my kids worked uh, at Thunder Thighs with their aunt and uncle and um, nephew for many summers. And so they were really helpful actually telling me their stories. And uh, um, yeah, so everyone was really on side with it. So I'm really, really grateful for that. I have an interesting question here. This is from Marilyn Job. Are you a social worker? <laughs> 
you no, know social work in your background? I am not actually, thanks for the question. I'm not a social worker, uh, but it does raise an interesting point that I did work with a social worker and uh, a psychotherapist. I had them read through the book, through the manuscript. Um, so, th but no, I'm not trained as a social worker. We have a question from Valerie Sherrard. Hi, Valerie. How did writing Firefly compare to your other books? Did the realism give you a different or stronger connection to your characters? Hi, Valerie. Um, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I don't think it was any different, honestly. The way that I write is I'm pretty connected to my characters all the way through them. I have a really good sense of who they are. I hear their voice really clearly. So uh, I don't think anything was, it was different in that way, finding Firefly's voice. Firefly has a pretty strong voice. She's a pretty strong character. Like her personality came to me quite um, vividly. And I, I don't think it's really any different from my other characters. You know, my gargoyles were pretty strong characters in, in their own right. The strange gift of Gwendolyn Golden, she was a real character. So I didn't find, no, I, I I didn't find any particular difference. It's a good question, but for me, it, would, they were, it was the same. Frida Wyshynski has a question for you. Hi, Frida. Um, what do you think your sister-in-law would have said about the book? She sounds special. Uh, hi, Frida. That's a really lovely question. Uh, you know, all my writer friends are here. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> it's so lovely to hear from you and to be supported by you. Um, I think I think my sister-in-law would have been really touched. I, I used to write poetry for her and uh, sometimes music. And, uh, you know, she was an artist. She was a great, great creative artist. So I think that she would have, I think she would have been really moved by it. I think she would have, uh, I think she would have, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we have another author, Susan Hughes is here, and she asked, um, hey, Philippa, where did your story begin? With the character, with the idea, the costume story, costume, uh, story setting? Thanks for um, the question. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the story started with a particular image that turned into what a piv pivotal scene. Um, it started with... Uh, the two characters, Firefly and Charlie. Well, I didn't have names for them yet. It started with two kids on a bridge looking uh, down at the uh, um, DVP. Uh, so it was a fall day. And, and so there's just this image popped into my head, these kids wearing costumes, looking down uh, over the bridge. And so that's how it started. And, and I realized, gee, that's a really vivid image, so I want to explore that. And that's how the story came together. It, was just, it just took off from that image. Sometimes that, things like that just pop into your head as a writer. Colleen Nelson wants to know, what are you working on next? Hi, Colleen. Um, thanks. What I'm working on next is, uh, well, there's a sequel possibly coming to uh, Oculum. So there's, there's, there's that. I also have a high fantasy um, story for middle grade readers. It's just really, really fun. It's called The Story Hunters of Fen. And it's about kids that are living in a land without stories and they have to go hunting for them and they finally catch one. Um, and then there's some longer term things too that I can't, I can't really talk about yet. But uh, you know, we're always working on something. Okay. Are there any more questions before we pass this along? Perhaps if you have a question about thunder thighs, um, Sarah Kemp is here and she could answer a few questions if you wanted to know. Uh, Karen Stafford just wants to know, um, how long did it take you to write Firefly? Hi, Karen. Um, you know, it was actually really fast because I think the setting was so clear to me and the character was so vibrant and aware. It, it's probably the fastest book I've ever written. It was about, first draft was probably about four months. Usually it's more like a year. So I, I, I really kind of zoomed through it. Now it is, it, it is deliberately a slightly shorter story. It's 40, 42,000 words, but it's not, um, you know, it's, I wanted it to be a really tight snapshot of those 10 days, first 10 days with her aunt. So um, it's not super long either. It's not like a really long book. 
Um, yeah, so about four months to write it, the first draft anyway. It looks like Susan Hughes has a question for Sarah. I assume it's about the costume shop because she says, who came up with the name for the costume shop? I assume it's Thunder Thighs. Uh, if it's corseted lady, then we can ask Philip, but if it's the Thunder Thighs, Sarah, it's yours. Yeah, I think it's probably about Thunder Sarah? Thighs, so I can, I can answer this. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. So yeah, this was my my aunt, my aunt Linda. Um, she came up with the name for the costume shop, and I can say that it's because they run in the family, <laughs> and this is how she was she was known um, amongst her friends on set. So she one day explained it to me. She said, "Whose name do you think is on the sign?" Like that. Obviously, she was talking about herself. <laughs> so she was um, she loved poking fun at herself for sure. That's funny. Now you said on the set, does that mean she was actually an actor? Or a costumer um, yeah, on so set of movies? Yeah, so before she got into costuming, she did a bit of acting and she was actually on the Polka Dot Door, which is the TVO show. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Um, and then she got into costuming and she did a lot of costume design work as well as aggregating the business. So she was doing them at the same time, and then she sort of went full time into uh, just working at, at the costume shop. Got it. Okay, that's great. That's great. What about the corseted lady? Where did that one come from, Philippa? <laughs> well, uh, the corseted lady is actually uh, there's quite a few Easter eggs in this story, and so anyone that knew. Um, Linda knew that she had a ladies group, you know, that they would go out and have fun on the town. And um, it was called uh, the Course Lady Society. <laughs> so I took that and I turned it into the fun, a fun name for, for her shop, the Corseted Lady, uh, which I think she would have really loved. She would have thought that was hilarious, so. <laughs> If there's no more questions, we can turn this over to Philippa and Chantel um, to take care of picking a winner for a giveaway. And uh, I just like to say what a pleasure it's been for me to do this, for me to be able to, to chat with you about Firefly and to introduce her a little bit more to the world so that those who haven't bought the book are surely buying it now. I can see by the chat they are. <laughs> so thank you very much, Chantel and Philippa. Hi, well, thanks so much, Helen. Uh, it's been really fun. This is obviously not how we normally do book launches, but it's really great to celebrate uh, we, when we have something to celebrate. And those were great questions and really fun to answer. I'd like to thank uh, Chantel too and uh, DCB, my publisher. And I'd like to thank Another Story Bookshop. And I'd like to sh thank Thunder Thighs and my nephew at Thunder Thighs for all the support. And um, yeah, I hope, um, I hope that you enjoy the story. If you're going to um, read it, uh, I hope it speaks to you. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone for thank coming. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to Helen, Philippa and Sarah. And thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. I, before I let you all go, I would just like to quickly announce the winner of our giveaway. Um, I did this just a moment ago and the winner is Rebecca Upjohn. So congratulations. Rebecca, you've won a free costume rental from Thunder Thighs Costumes. Uh, if you could email me, I just sent my email into the chat, but it's c.cho at cormorantbooks.com um, to claim your prize. Um, and well, it's time to bring this evening to a close. I want to remind everyone that you can request a signed copy of Firefly from Another Story Bookshop. Um, and if you'd like to share a photo of yourself in costume on Instagram or on Twitter and tag us, you will be entered to win a free copy of the book. Uh, and with that, thank you again to everyone for joining us. And I hope you had a fun time. Good night, everyone.